You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of our show where we discuss the latest news about Apple, iPhone, iPad, Mac, Apple Watch, and more. We're recording on Thursday, April 9th, 2015. Today we'll be discussing all the Apple Watch reviews that are out, the initial impressions and thoughts. The 12-inch MacBook reviews are also out, and we'll talk about that a little bit. OS 10.10.3, Photos for Mac, and iOS 8.3 are out, as well as iCloud Photo Library is out of beta, so you can all try it. DJI's new Phantom 3 drone, and more. Before we begin, we'd like to give a thank you to Blue Microphones, who provided some microphones for the hosts on this show. We've been using them for the past several weeks, and uh, we definitely enjoy them and like them. So we want to thank Blue Microphones for letting us use those, and definitely check them out at bluemic.com, B-L-U-E-M-I-C.com. Hi, I'm Neil. I'm Shane. And I'm Steven Robles, and we're here... Big news this week, all the reviews came out for the Apple Watch. There were reviews from The Verge, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, and a bunch of other outfits, as well as the MacBook, which we'll get to. But let's talk about the watch, Uh, initial impressions and all that. Some of the concerns I've heard from uh, most of the reviews were performance concerns, like when you launch a full app on the watch, or when you're waiting for it to find your location, there was a lot of waiting a lot of the watch is kind of loading i don't know if you guys saw that in some of the videos but um that was a concern we just didn't know about before yeah that was kind of a surprise apple apparently had told uh, one of the reviewers that they're planning on uh issuing a software update before the launch on the 24th to address some of that but that was definitely disappointing i mean i don't know how into the third party apps i'm going to be at launch it looks like some of the stuff is a little gimmicky and it might take some time but uh, still, to take so long to launch like that, I think, is, is a big disappointment. Well, and something like, like Uber, which were probably one of the more useful apps on the watch, you know, being able to hail a car right from your wrist. You know, one of the nice things about Uber is they come quickly, and you can hail it relatively easily with the app. But if you're kind of waiting around for the app to find your location, and it's like 10, 20, 30 seconds, you know, I feel like the, the usefulness might kind of start dropping, where it's just be easier and quicker to pull out your phone. I'm curious what the um, whether that's a limitation of power or if it's a limitation of the bandwidth of the connection between the watch and the phone. I mean, it's it's Bluetooth. You know, I'm sure it's in those situations like that. It's like a direct Bluetooth connection. So, and the phone can you know find your location usually pretty quickly. So I don't I don't know. I mean, you might be right, but it, it might also be a thing where again, this is the first version of a product. And then also what a lot of the reviews were saying, like this is version one, just like iPhone version one, just like iPad version one. They will probably be underpowered for what the watch will be capable of a year from now. Uh, so you just might kind of see that kind of uh, performance hit. Yeah. Well, the, one of the interesting things um, that you know in the reviews was saying about how they're not really sure about the usefulness of watches and whatever. As somebody who has had the unfortunate... Uh, a uh, situation where I've been forced to test pretty much every smartwatch that's compatible with the iPhone to date, um, and having had to uh, deal with some of those on my wrist for a few days at a time to have the awful experience of it. I will say that the best thing about having a smartwatch is the convenience and glanceability of it. Um, one of my favorite uh, wearable devices, which still had its huge share of problems, was uh, the Meta Watch, because you could have customizable widgets on it where you could put certain things on the screen that you want to be able to look down and check. So you might want the weather, you might want your calendars, you might want news alerts or whatever, but you would choose what was on there. And Apple kind of addressed that with the um, uh, the so-called complications that are on the watch faces, which is great. So it has that glanceability. But if I have to spend a lot of time looking down at the watch to launch an app and uh, wait for it to load and all that, then that's really going to kill a lot of the usefulness, I think, of it in the short term. But as you say... I think that this is something that's going to get addressed in the long term. You're going to see native Apple Watch uh, apps that are right. supposed to be coming in the future. Uh, Apple says they're working on a software update for it. So I don't think there's cause for concern yet on that front, but it is disappointing to read. And there was also um, Joshua Topolsky reviewed the Apple Watch for Bloomberg. And uh, in his video review, he actually said he experienced not all the time, but there were often enough where he would flick, you know, move his wrist to look at the watch and it wouldn't turn on right away. And he kind of had to shake it around or a little bit. You know, I hope maybe with that performance update, the software update Apple's talking about, that kind of 
issue won't happen a lot. But, uh, you know, that would, again, the whole purpose is you can glance quickly. So, if, you know, if it's not turning on all the time, then that kind of hinders that u- usability. Was it the I, iPhone 5 uh, when uh, uh, Apple issued a software update that kind of screwed up the um, – uh, the thing that would turn proximity. the screen off would yeah, yeah, a proximity sensor, and it was like a software issue. So, right, right. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of that, you know, with the raise to look at the watch. I, I wonder how consistently and how well that's going to work when I get it on my wrist, just because it seems like this is something that's very finicky, even on the phone sometimes. I actually, through um, ways I'm not supposed to disclose, uh, have used an Apple Watch. <laughs> and I can tell you that it actually, it definitely is a little bit of a problem. Um, you have to give it a pronounced wrist movement. I, I'm not necessarily a flick, but it has to be an obvious. I'm turning my wrist around, and so, I think that could probably be solved um, through a tweak to the the detection algorithm. But it's not going to be. It's not ever going to be as easy to look at as an actual static, you know, watch sitting on your wrist. Right. So it's not. It's not the speed of the movement, but it's kind of a. A range thing where it has to be a, a large enough motion. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's not, it's it's not the speed; it's the actual. Um, it feels itself guess, turning, kind of. Yeah, exactly. It has to actually. It's kind of like when you can, if you can slowly turn an iPhone to the side and have it not change orientation. Same right. kind of deal. Right. I feel like this is just kind of a behavioral issue too, though, right? Because you know, like f- if I use a regular watch or even you know some of these smart watches with these e-ink or low power displays that are always on one of the things is i'll just kind of look down and not even raise my wrist and so obviously this motion of having to raise your wrist to have it turn on seems like one of those things that it it might take some getting used to at first but kind of like you know sliding to unlock or learning gestures or whatever at over time it might not really be that big of a deal because you just get used to that's how it works yeah there was a josh tosley again for uh, bloomberg he was saying you know the timekeeping they kept making a big deal about that at both events. Like it's the best timekeeping, whatever. And he was saying, if you actually have a bunch of Apple watches in the room and they all have the Mickey mouse face that all the feet would actually be tapping in sync. Like (laughs) they made, they made a big deal out of that yesterday. Also in a wired piece, they interviewed Alan Dye, who's the human interface chief. Mm. Um, He specifically called that out and said that that's something that they actually spent a lot of time working on. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. I mean, I guess, you know, if you're a time, I don't know, savant or whatever they call it, I mean, I guess that's cool. I mean, everyone who has an Apple Watch, I guess, would all think it's exactly the same time. I guess there's no discrepancy, so. Isn't it just getting the time from the from the phone anyhow, though? Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. I have to see. I mean, I guess... That is all, an excellent question. Yeah, I mean, all iPhones, I would assume, you know, if you have it to set time automatically i would assume all iphones would be exactly the same too yeah it's but, just done over the data connection i assume right, i would think so uh i don't i think they use the they get it from the towers they don't use ntp mm. i could be wrong okay so another concern about the watch before the reviews were out were battery life and of course every review touched on battery life um i, I would want to call out the verges review because they have some really cool web design stuff going on but uh, <laughs> him him and all they said all, all the reviewers said, you know, they, you can get through a day. Um, most said, you know, some days there was maybe 20% left at 11 p.m., maybe 30% after full day's use. If you really are using it, um, you know, it can get down five or seven. And I guess there's there's actually a power saving mode. So if it does get down to like single digit percents, it can just show the time and, you know, won't do any of the other functionality stuff. But, I mean, you're going to have to charge it every night. I mean, there's not going to be any getting around, any way to get around that. Yeah, I found the comments about the power actually kind of encouraging. You know, I, I was already resigned, I guess, to the fact that I was going to have to charge it every night. But the fact that it can get through a day even with people testing it for review purposes uh, who are obviously going to be, you know, giving it heavy use. You know, those first few days you get it, it's going to be a new gizmo and you're going to spend a lot of time playing with it. The fact that it can get through a day is encouraging, I think. Yeah, and, you know, people are complaining, like, I don't want to have to charge another device. But I'm like, well, I'm already charging two or three devices every night. And, and the way the magnetic latch charges on the watch it seems like of all the devices that'll be the easiest to just kind of pop on the charger and let it go so you got to think that that's technology that's eventually going to come to iphones and ipads maybe once they're ready to ditch the lightning port and just go completely wireless or something just because of the convenience of it that would be great i mean you know the samsung galaxy s6 has the wireless charging now 
Um, the speed of charging is slow, you know, slower than actually plugging it in. So that's one thing. But the thing with the phone is too, most people have a case. So I don't know how they would get around that unless there's yeah. a way to do it through the case. But usually inductive charging has to touch. So well, we'll see. So a uh, battery life, you're going to get through a day most of the time. A performance remains to be seen. Uh, you know, all the the glancing and functionality wise, I wish, I don't understand why email, you can't respond to email on the watch. I understand emails are usually longer form. Uh, you may not want to be typing out a huge thing, but it seems kind of strange to not be able to just reply to an email. Yeah. I mean, that's gotta be something that's coming right with dictation or something along those lines. I, I would, I would think that that's kind of a no brainer. Right. I mean, then you could do it with, with the, the text messages on the watch. So I don't know. Right. I'm not sure. And it'll display all your emails just like it will all your texts. So. Who knows? They were so, so a lot of the reviewers were saying uh, the the two standout things that were more impressive uh, after using it for a week was the um, the Taptic uh, engine, which will like tap your wrist when you have a notification. Uh, they just said kind of the sensation of that tap is is very different, and but also welcome as a different way to actually get notifications. And uh, the digital touch, uh, they thought you know a lot of the reviews were saying. I don't know so much about the usefulness of it, but um, it is, it's just kind of a new way to interact as opposed to just talking to someone, sending them a text. It's a different way to communicate. So maybe that would be a big thing with kind of teenagers and a younger crowd, but it's there. Send your heartbeat and all that kind of stuff. So Hey, Ma- hey Mom, I'm still alive. <laughs> right. Here's my heartbeat. Not dead. <laughs> but, I mean, it is cool, you know, putting the two fingers on there like you're checking your pulse. Yeah. I mean, that's a neat yeah. little Apple touch. I, I think it's cool. Yeah, I Can I just say, I just now got that when you said that, it clicked for me. I didn't realize that was like checking your pulse before, but now yeah, that you say that. Yeah, I saw in the pulse. video reviews, I saw people doing that. I was like, ah, oh, it makes sense, you know, pulse. But I'm, it's, it's clever. I mean, it's cutesy, yeah. but, it, you know, it's, it's a device that still needs to kind of find its purpose. And I don't think stuff like that is going to be a big seller for most, most people that buy it. But it's a cool first generation kind of look what we can do, gee whiz kind of thing. I, do, I don't remember who it Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, I don't remember who it was, but somebody said uh, the reason everyone is rushing to make smartwatches now is so that when somebody comes up with a compelling use case for one, they can make it happen. <laughs> and yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that's totally right on. Nobody really, it's like we said in our review roundup yesterday, nobody knows what a smartwatch should do. I don't know what a smartwatch should do. I think um, I I live in a big city. Neil, you live in a big city. We walk around all day. We would love to not have to pull our phones out of our pockets all the time. But is notifications on your wrist a huge, large enough value proposition to spend four hundred or five hundred or a thousand dollars on a device? Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to Siri on the watch because for the first yeah. time you'll be able to use Siri without having to touch or activate anything. You just yeah, that's going to be awesome. I'm excited about Siri. Uh, again, having tested a bunch of smartwatches, um, I think uh, you know some of the best use cases are for fitness. Uh, controlling music, uh, especially like if I'm running or something like that and I want to change music or whatever, exercising. And then this is highly specific, but one of the best use cases I've had for a smartwatch is while I'm skiing because if I'm out on a mountain and there's people trying to get in touch with me and my phone is in a pocket and I'll never hear it in a million years uh, and I get a notification on my wrist letting me know that someone's calling me or texting me, then I know that I can pull out my phone and text them or call them and meet up with them. Uh, for yeah. that use, it was great, but I mean, <laughs> you know, all the skiers of the world buy your smartwatch, right? Like, I don't. <laughs> right. it's, it, it really is uh, something that needs to find its its place. Uh, that, I think that was one thing. Uh, Christy Turlington Burns in one of her recent blogs on the Apple website was saying she never misses a call now because you know if her phone were sometimes were in her purse and it was on vibrate, she might miss a call. Or and my wife, you know, she runs into that too. Phones in the purse, phones in the other room. She left it on vibrate. She's saying at least with the watch. Even if she ignores a call or declines it, like she's not going to miss one. And I think that's one of the nice things about this new Taptic engine, uh, being able to notify you that way. And I'm actually looking forward to not hearing so many dings. Like I sit here at my Mac and, you know, if you have, um, I, was, I wrote an article recently about continuity and how to get your phone calls on your Mac. And like just all the sounds that like happens throughout the day, like someone calls you on your phone, your Mac starts ringing. And <laughs> I'm looking forward to like not having to hear so much of that. I think it could be. Gruber actually said, I think he said that without the Taptic engine, the the little actuator, that the watch is not a compelling device. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. And that's one of the things Neelai Patel said in, uh, in his review. The notifications, 
uh, were a little overwhelming at first. I guess they all come on like full blast and you need a, you can turn on or off what apps you want to notify you, but yeah. there definitely needs to be a more granular control in the next software update, uh, which I'm sure WDB, WWDC is coming up. Uh, we'll have to be seeing some kind of uh, software update already for the watch. I think that granular control is is really important as well. Um, again, having tested all these watches, you know, there are some that only give you limited notifications. There are some that give you all notifications. The Meta Watch was one that allowed me to switch on and off specific apps that I would get notifications. But even if I could control the types of notifications I was getting on an app by app basis, would be really nice. And uh, as far as look, you know, all the reviews obviously talked about the design and overall look of it. Um, Neil Patel again also actually brought it to the the fashion. Um, the department of, of Vox. And uh, they kind of were saying, mm, as a fashion product, so-so fashion people will probably just find a reason to like it. Uh, but I will say the um, the steel uh, link bracelet with the steel Apple Watch, that was uh, in the Bloomberg review. You can see lots of pictures there. I think it actually looks pretty good. I mean, it actually looks like a watch people would buy. So I don't know if you guys are fashion enthusiasts. <laughs> Be- being tech <laughs> bloggers, I don't know if we are, but... A lot of people were complaining about the shape, uh, but the old Cartier watch, whose name escapes me at this moment, was square. It's the, the grandfather of all watches, and okay, yeah, you know, it's the original. It does look. It looks a little thick. I would say. Yeah. Uh, you you would have to imagine that you know second maybe third generation thinner. Uh, that's just a, lo- a logical progression. So then it becomes you know you talk about the stainless steel Apple Watch versus the sport model. Do you really want to spend six hundred dollars plus on a first generation device, and then have a thinner model come out next year? Do you want to wait? Do you want to buy the cheap sport now, and then maybe get the stainless steel when it gets thinner and better looking? It's a tough decision. Right. So let's... I think everybody was unanimous in saying buy the sport if you're going to buy an Apple Watch. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So uh, we're recording this on Thursday, uh, April 9th. And we'll try to get this out same day because the pre-orders happen tonight. It's um, They happen on April 10th, 12.01 a.m., so right on the turn of the dime. And that's Pacific time. So if you're on the East Coast, you can pre-order it at 3.01 a.m., which is always fun for our – I'm on the East Coast. I think, Neil, you are too. So it's, yep. <laughs> uh, it's always fun when you get to uh, pre-order it then. So yeah, I can't wait to be frustrated and refreshing my computer at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's going to be a lot of fun. Man, I it, really hope I, – I pre-ordered the iPhone 6 Plus the day, and that was a nightmare. <laughs> it always is. It is every time. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon for me, so I'll be leisurely <laughs> uh, eating lunch <laughs> while you guys are. <laughs> See, if I was you know Pacific time I w- or even you know if it was 1 a.m. like mountain time or something, I would stay up. But 3 a.m. is like – Yeah, that's no man's land. That's, you can't stay up and you set an alarm. It's yeah. the worst possible time. Nothing good happens at 3 a.m. I will say when the iPhone 5S came out to pre-order, I pre-ordered one for my wife through the app on my phone done in like 90 seconds. Like it just worked flawlessly. But uh, for the iPhone 6 Plus, I mean, obviously, there were, Apple had tons of problems that night. But it took me about 45 minutes, and I did it through AT&T eventually. The Apple website never worked. So hopefully, since we're not dealing with carriers, hopefully that's not the case tonight. I, I find the whole process kind of interesting because you have to pre-order before you can go into the store and try it on. And if you want to wait and try it on before you order it, you're going to be penalized because presumably they're going to sell out immediately, right? Or at right. least in the first few hours. So let's say you book an appointment to go into a store and try it on on Saturday. Well, you might not get it for like six weeks after that if they sold through right. their their inventory. So by you know actually taking your time and trying to figure out the band that you want and the style that you want and the size that you want, you actually may not be able to get it on launch day. We had a couple of articles go up. Some said that uh, certain models may already have a delay without even being sold out. And obviously, well, with most Apple products, you know, certain tiers and models just sell out right away. With the bands, you know, because you can buy the bands individually, most of them, some of them like the steel link bracelet and stuff, I think you have to purchase with the watch. But as far as the Milanese loop and some of the leather loop bands, you'll be able to purchase them separately. So I will go online and see, we have a buying guide and I'll link it into show notes, you know, find out what bracelet you were interested in. And if you could buy it separately, just don't, you know, don't worry about pre-ordering that. Just get the sport or just get whatever, you know, the sport bands come with the watch, uh, whichever model you, you choose by default. So you'll have a band, you know, you'll have a way to wear it and wait on ordering the other ones later. Um, 
But as far as, you know, I would suggest try to use the Apple Store app on your iPhone or iPad. Usually that works better uh, when pre-ordering. And again, it's 1201 Pacific Time, Friday, uh, April 10th, or 301 a.m. Eastern Time, or wherever you are, Shane, at 3 in the afternoon, <laughs> for our <laughs> listeners in China. So <clears throat> that's the Apple Watch. Also, Are, are you pre-ordering one, Stephen? I am going to pre-order one. Yes. And I know you've been going back and forth. Shane, where are you at today? Uh, at this exact second, I'm on a yes. <laughs> okay. I'm getting the uh, I'm getting the larger uh, sport model space gray. Yeah, that one looks pretty good. Yeah, uh, I'd I, like the darker color. And if I went for the stainless steel, it's eleven hundred dollars, uh, yeah. <laughs> which I can't really justify that for for this device. So four hundred dollars, I feel like I can kind of stomach yeah um especially you know if i can sell it for about half that next year when the next model comes out or something right. but do you use uh, a yeah. uh, do you use a space gray iphone i do yes have you looked at it on your wrist <laughs> uh i actually have not thought of that no I, I i have not because the the space gray this always happens for every apple product the space gray looks awesome on the website and when you get it in real life it does not look that good at all well, I think it looks okay on my iPhone. I don't mind it. And my iPad as well. I just mean, I, I don't mean that good. I mean that dark. It always looks nice and, you know. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not that dark. dark. Yeah. 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 It's like, a, it ends up like a titanium sort of color. Well, but it probably, it's, you know, on the back of the iPhone, it's kind of like, it's going to be darker than that. I, I imagine it's darker than that. I, I do wish that they would bring back the, uh, the darker uh, iPhone 5 color. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was nice. Um, and that, the, the sport dark aluminum is the only one that's dark because the stainless steel is all, it's obviously stainless steel. There's no, no, there, there is a dark, steel. there's a black stainless steel, oh, that's darker, yeah. darker than the space gray, but it's only with the, uh, steel stainless steel b- link band and it's, yeah. and it's a special black link band to match it. It's the, right. it's the most expensive stainless steel. Right. Right. Yeah. So if you want to get the darker watch, you got to spend $1,100, uh, you mm, know, yeah, yeah, at yeah. that point, I, I don't think I'm game, but right, so that's right. why I'm going to go with the sport model. Now that the sport model is, um, uh, is uh, also lighter than the stainless steel, sure. and I'm planning on using it while I run and stuff like that. So um, that I think that's more appealing to me. Yeah. Well, we also had a couple articles. Um, Pharrell was caught sporting one during The Voice the other night. He had <laughs> uh, he had the white uh, sport band, and uh, there's a picture on that on the site. And uh, also there was that uh, unboxing video uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, we have that video and article on the website. So if you just have to see what the uh, box looks like and what it looks like when you're going to open it, you can see that uh, unboxing video. So aside from Apple Watch reviews, uh, there was also uh, the 12-inch MacBook reviews. Uh, the embargo lifted, again, today is Thursday. So at noon, the uh, 12-inch MacBook, the new uh, 12-inch Retina uh, reviews came out. And there were a, a lot of the same impressions I feel like people had when the event happened. It's a beautiful design, beautiful looking laptop. Uh, keyboard is nice. Uh, reviews are saying you get used to it. The Force trackpad is pretty cool. And, um, you know, unless you just kind of, it's like the original MacBook Air, I would say. If you have the extra money to, to blow on just a cool device and you're not going to be doing anything processor intensive on it, people are saying it's a great device to have. But if you do anything, you know, any kind of graphic related or any kind of gaming or any kind of processor intensive task, you know, this is not the, uh, the computer for you. It does look great. I think it's the computer for the millions of people who have uh, MacBook Pros or high spec MacBook Airs and use them for Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for I sure. mean, we've made fun of it on AI before, the $2,000 Facebook machine, but it's totally true. The number of people I know who have expensive Macs and just, you know, browse the web, check Gmail, and yeah. talk to their friends is insane. Well, and I mean, I would say 80 to 90% of college students, you know, unless they're into video editing, graphic design, stuff like that, you know, they're, they're writing papers, doing research. And uh, checking our email and, like you're saying, doing Facebook. So I think this would be a great uh, model computer, I think, for college students, uh, maybe if it was a little cheaper. Um, yeah, the, the price is going to have to come down eventually. It, it'll be yeah. like the MacBook Air and even the Retina MacBook Pro before it, right? Right. Start out a little expensive um, and then kind of refine it a little bit and get the price down to a point where – and you're going to see the MacBook Air hang around for a while too before they axe it. I mean you can still buy a legacy 13-inch MacBook Pro right now. So right. it's going to hang around until they can get the price down to a point where they don't really need it. 
But I mean, you still have a 11 inch MacBook Air at nine hundred dollars, and I bet they're selling a lot of those. So I don't think the MacBook yeah. Air is going to go anywhere anytime soon. I it's think... also worth. Go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. I was just going to say it's also worth noting that there's been a resurgence lately of people by going back to the split desktop laptop combo rather than lugging around desktop replacement laptops. Yeah. And I think that this really serves that market very well. I think this will also serve those who are kind of using the iPad keyboard case as their main computer deal. Mm -hmm. And if this reaches, I think, the magic price point of $9.99, like in a couple of years, I think this would be the kind of go-to for someone like that who only needs really what an iPad can do but wants a laptop. Uh, it seems yeah. like this would be a good, good choice. Yeah, I, I like everything about this new MacBook. I'm just bitter about MagSafe. Why they ditched MagSafe, I don't know. I can't let it go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I don't mind the one port. I don't mind the USB-C connector. It, it, it's okay. But the fact that you have to plug in an adapter to charge and plug something in at the same time is insane to me. And the fact that, you know, you can't have this great technology that they've had patented for years that no one else has been able to use because of the patents that they have that continues to be a defining feature of MacBooks uh, that make them better than PCs. Why not just have a separate MagSafe charger on this thing? I would hope that yeah. like with a, a second generation version of it, they see the light and one port for USB and one MagSafe connector. That would be great. Yeah. I think, I, yeah, I think I the idea is that you're just not supposed to use it while it's plugged in. Right. Right. Like I mean, that's it. Like if you're a student, you just charge it every night and then yeah. you just do you know go all day with it yeah it's not a it's not a desk bound notebook it's you know it, i mean it is what it is it's very thin very light and less capable than it could be specifically because you're supposed to use it that's the you idea can... but you know how people are going to use it they're going to use it plugged in at home i mean that's oh, just yeah, the way it's going to be yeah, yeah. you know and they're saying obviously everything wirelessly like airdrop and stuff like that is why you don't need ports but i have to say airdrop continues to fail me on my <laughs> iMac. It's just maddening. Like I'll, I'll have my iPhone, my iPad, and Mac all on AirDrop, all for, to everyone. As you know, it's not even contacts only. And yep. my iPad sees my iPhone and vice versa. And my iPhone sees my Mac to send stuff there, but my Mac does not see any any of them. It's just gone. I don't know what the deal is. So. It, yeah, it's not consistent. I, I, have you ever been uh, uh, trolled because you have it set to airdrop for everyone? Like, is anybody just like that you didn't know send you something? <laughs> no, I'm OCD about that. I, I always make sure to <laughs> shut it down whenever I'm not using it. I, I'm having flashbacks to in college where you would be on a network in the dorm and see somebody's shared printer and like oh, send yeah. stuff to their printer and stuff like that. You yeah. know, there was a, this is bad. I, I don't, maybe I shouldn't say it, but you know, <laughs> there were oh, come on, there were stuff. You know, in uh, in college, everyone's on the same network, and you know. Theoretically, so there were apps, you know, you could see other people's iTunes libraries and just kind of right. <laughs> just grab yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I did that a couple of times, I'll, I'll be yeah. honest. And then I went back and bought every album I stole. Don't worry. I have, I have to say, when you gave the disclaimer up front, that's not the way I thought that story was going to go. <laughs> really? I mean. Yeah, well, that was pretty was tame. That was pretty tame. Yeah. yeah I, I was thinking there was going to be some serious net send shenanigans. No, no, I, I wasn't doing anything crazy, but I, I was just boosting music off people i, I got, i'm gonna try that i'm gonna put my my phone to airdrop on everybody and see if i get like any sort of random like pictures or stuff sent to me if Man. anybody's out there trolling i don't know if that's a big thing or not <laughs> i guess it would require airdrop to actually work right yeah, true <laughs> I mean, but you know if you're in an apartment building or you know i would maybe walk by a college campus or something and try it and see <laughs> i'm sure lots of people uh sending crazy stuff out there so that was the 12-inch uh, MacBook. Those reviews are out. And then you can uh, order it starting tomorrow, again, Friday, April 10th. Uh, this week, also, just more big news. OS 10.10.3 and iOS 8.3 came out, where Photos for Mac is now publicly available. It's uh, It came with 10.10.3. And iCloud Photo Library came out of beta. So now everyone can upgrade to that. I upgraded all my devices. I You know... Some people are smart and they kind of wait to see if there's any bugs in OS updates. I just, I go whole hog and I just kind of update everything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I've not seen any problems so far and um, been using photos for Mac uh, yesterday and today. And um, after, all, you know, I had to sync and download everything. And uh, once it got all situated, I mean, it's, it's working pretty good. I'm able to make changes in photos for Mac uh, on my photos and I see it reflect on my phone. I could delete things, you know, multiple places. So uh, it's looking pretty good. 
I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I, I've been uh, using it uh, for a few months now um, through the beta, and it seems to work pretty well. I mean, it's light. It's not. Uh, right. It, it, it's actually less featured in many ways than iPhoto, but uh, I think for most people that's okay. And it, it just seems more familiar. So if somebody's new to the Mac uh, and they get on a Mac and they have the Photos app on there, they'll they'll at least be familiar. Yeah. And I do I do like how they have panoramas, slow mos, and bursts kind of automatically separated. That's kind of cool. Um, I will, you know, my con- my concern still remains like when people want to delete photos off their phone to save space. I know, you know, the way iCloud Photo Library works, you can tell your iPhone to just keep, you know, really low res thumbnails of photos to save space on your iPhone. Yeah. But I still think people are going to delete stuff on their phone and you're just going to get it. It tells you like this is going to delete it everywhere, but I don't know if people are going to realize that. It's just going to lose pictures kind of across their devices, but We'll see. Well, for me, I keep having photos repopulate. Uh, I'll delete them and say, yes, I don't want this anymore. Because um, I have an app that reminds me once a month called Flick to go through and delete photos from last month that I don't want. Hmm. And so I go once a month and I go through and delete and they keep reappearing because they're synced somewhere else and they get pushed back up to the cloud. And I, it, it's very frustrating because I'll spend a lot of time trying to prune my photos and then it comes back. So there's yeah. still some kinks to be worked out, it seems. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's still like, I just took um, several photos this morning and they don't they didn't automatically go up to iCloud library like i guess i don't know if it's supposed to do it automatically if you're on wi-fi and power but um i have to open the photos app on my phone to kind of get them to sync and now they're appearing on my mac right now so yeah but, sometimes those are the, the, how it syncs is a mystery I, I took some photos a couple weeks ago um and then went into an apple store and swapped out my phone and then i got the new phone and the photos were missing and i was like oh i lost those photos oh well and then like a week later they just showed up so i don't know how that happened or what yeah. triggered it or something but it happened so yeah um it looks nice you know we'll, we'll see again how it changes over the next few months or years but uh, you can get that now there were free updates uh, there weren't many other changes uh, in, in the OS 10. There was a bunch of bug fixes on iOS 8.3 and performance improvements like for Wi-Fi, stuff like that. And the, the biggest notable difference, a lot of people were excited about this, was the, the new emoji keyboard. Uh, the built-in emoji keyboard now has a lot more faces and images and stuff like that, but also diverse emojis. So you have several um, you know, colors for the people and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of cool. You could check it out. I did notice, I think the uh, keyboard switching got a little faster with iOS 8.3. Um, so that was kind of a welcome change. That was yeah. the biggest change that I've ever seen in an iOS release. The, the release notes were five pages long. <laughs> right, but, but they were mostly all like improvements and stuff like that, right? Uh, many, many very specific bugs fixed. Right. Um, I actually yeah. really like the me- I have a lot of message spam for because China and uh, the fact that I can now separate that into people who are not in my contacts is amazing. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah, it, like creates a little um uh, second pane for unknown contacts so the messages automatically go there. It's pretty cool. Oh uh, yeah, I should have explained that. It also uh, mutes notifications from anybody who's not in your Well, contacts. that's always been in iOS. You could go, well, at least not always, but for for a little while now you could mute those notifications, but now they're actually segregated into a separate pane in the messages uh, app as well. I didn't know that the mute was a setting. Yeah, it was a, it was a setting before. It just was don't give notifications from unknown contacts. But now when you flip it on, not only do you not get the notifications, but you also get them separated into a separate section of the Messages app. Okay. Very nice. So those are out there. You can download them uh, for free now. Uh, Neil was at the um, DJI's Phantom 3 event, and we got a big post up there. So I'll throw it to you, Neil, and you can kind of tell us what happened there. Yeah, so they announced uh, two new drones, the Phantom 3 Advance, uh, which is going to be for $1,000, and then the Phantom 3 Professional, which I believe was uh, $1,250. Looks the same as the previous Phantom drones, Um, uh, changes under the hood and a lot of changes in the iOS app. Uh, I think the biggest uh, news from it really is the price. So if you got the or you were looking at the Phantom 2 Vision Plus, which came out a year ago, that cost uh, 1300. Uh, so the new one is more capable and <clears throat> has the uh, the same uh, three axis gimbal. and uh, so you get that really smooth uh, footage. 
and it's three hundred dollars cheaper. It's now a thousand bucks with all those improvements. So obviously, at a thousand bucks, is still something that's for serious enthusiasts only, uh, not for uh, you know somebody who just wants to play around. But uh, compared to a couple of years ago, where these things were costing like two thousand dollars, the fact that you can get a flying machine this powerful uh, that shoots this great of footage uh, for a thousand bucks is pretty awesome. And then for pro users, the only difference on the more expensive model is it has a 4K uh, video camera that shoots at 30 frames per second. So I would imagine for most people, the thousand dollar model will cut it. Um, but having used the the Phantom 2 Vision Plus, uh, despite the horrible name, uh, it is a uh, pretty great uh, product in terms of uh, the the caliber of the video that you get, and with the gimbal, the the really smooth um, video quality that you get out of it. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about this new Phantom 3. Uh, got a chance to just kind of look at it yesterday. I haven't flown it yet, but uh, DJI's done a really great job with their products in the past. They're really easy to fly. Um, and then there's some iOS improvements, which are pretty cool too. I think the uh, the neatest thing that they're doing um, is there's a dedicated button on the controller uh, where you can kind of mark a moment as you're recording that you like, and then it will remember all those, and the software will actually edit the video together for you. So they were saying that you could actually have a completed, edited video ready to go as soon as your drone lands, and then upload it to the internet right away, hmm. uh, just with like bookmarked moments that you have in the video that you were recording. Um, and they also showed the controller now has a direct... Uh, lightning connector for iPhone and iPad. So that will just plug into a uh, transmitter that connects to the drone from up to a mile away so you get live video. So you no longer have to connect to a Wi-Fi network that rebroadcasts and stuff like that. So it's just one less step that you have to worry about the lightning connection, which is welcome. So a lot of great changes um, and the, the price cut is pretty pretty great too. So I'm, I'm excited to get my hands on it and try it out. What is the... You use a drone a lot um, certainly a lot more than I do. What is <laughs> other, other than for people who specifically set out to go somewhere and use a drone to take awesome images, what is the use case for, uh, me, for instance, if I'm going on vacation and want to take some cool photos, is that, you know, is the technology at a point now where that's something I should consider or, you know, what's the, what's the score? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think, uh, if you're really uh, serious about taking photos, um, and you want to get great views and great vantage points of things, um, then yeah, a drone is is uh, definitely something worth considering. You know, like I, I know a guy who bought one and he uses it for professional purposes. He actually does flyovers of golf courses and makes money doing that. You know, this is stuff that used to take helicopters to do, and now you can just have this tiny thing and, and fly it up. Uh, but these drones now they're they're small enough that you can put them in a bag. Um, I flew one up to Banff a couple of years ago um, and flew it in the mountains up there and like negative 30 degree temperatures and got cool views of the mountains and stuff um i've seen people like take them out uh in the ocean like they go on a fishing trip and they do like flyovers of the boat while they're fishing and stuff i mean it's definitely again at, at, at that price for a thousand bucks it's still for very serious enthusiasts but honestly this thing is so easy to fly um and works so well and takes such great footage that it's hard uh, not to recommend it if you're looking into that kind of thing. Just you know, all, all the convenience you get with the, the portability, all that. I will give the disclaimer that uh, DJ, DJI sent me the last one, and I did crash it and uh, <laughs> break the camera off. So Oof. when I say that it's easy to fly, um, it was a very windy day, and I think there was like a GPS freakout, and uh, the it lost its positioning. So one of the cool things that the drone does is it'll lock its position, and then it will actually like fight the wind and stay where it is, so you can get like the stable shot and all that. So if you let go of the controls, like there are some flying machines where you have to like keep your thumb on the stick, you know, to hold the, the altitude. But the DJI, you get it in altitude, you let go, and it just sits there until you give it another command. And it, you can do like autopilot stuff too, like tell it to fly to a spot and have it fly back. So if you're like a cinematographer or something, you can get the same shot over and over until you get it perfect um but yeah it had like a gps freak out i was flying it at my parents house in florida and i took him outside and i was like check out this cool thing and it was like a really windy day <laughs> and then all of a sudden it just like went haywire and it crashed into some mangroves i i directed it at the last second so it didn't crash into the water uh which would have obviously completely ruined the thing but uh even despite the fact that it crashed it still survived the crash the camera broke off you would have to replace the camera obviously but the drone itself was 100 percent intact after having fallen from like 50 feet so it's pretty well made so <clears throat> the footage that it gets uh is it on like a sd card and can you i'm, I'm a noob when it comes to drones so it's yeah so uh it has a, a mini sd card 
a okay. micro SD that uh, uh, plugs into the camera itself on it, um, and it just records directly there. But it also has a built-in wireless transmitter on the drone that then broadcasts to your controller, so you can actually do live video from your iPhone or iPad and see what the camera's seeing and actually control the camera. So you can pan it up or down. Um, you can start recording, stop recording, you can take photos, you can take video, um, you can control everything from your iPhone in terms of the camera, and then it actually has physical controls. So like, unlike with the Parrot drone, which is more of a toy, you have to control that with you know your touchscreen. Mm. I don't know that I'd want to control a $300 drone with a touchscreen. I can barely play a video game with a touchscreen. Yeah. So yeah. having actual physical controls is a really nice thing about the DJI 2, and, uh, and they do have a great physical controller. And there is one new feature in the Phantom 3, uh, speaking of video, they it can live stream directly to YouTube Live now. Really? Yeah, and so it, as, you're, it, as you're flying, you can stream, uh, people can watch on your YouTube channel as you're in real time as you're flying. That's pretty yeah, cool. they did a couple of live streams uh, from the event yesterday, including um, in Singapore where they were at the top of a hotel, and it was a kind of a cool shot. They were partying with a bunch of uh, uh, young women who <laughs> were drinking alcohol, <laughs> and then they flew the drone out of a window, and then you saw, oh, they're actually in a high-rise in Singapore, and it panned over yeah. and showed the city. It was pretty neat. That's cool. But that's one of the new features of the Phantom 3 as well that they didn't have before is it can do indoor flight. It has some sort of a sensing mechanism where it can tell how far it is from the ground with like it must be a laser or something. And before, because it uses GPS to lock position outdoors, you couldn't fly it indoors. Unfortunately, I learned this the hard way and tried to fly a Phantom 2 indoors in an apartment in Manhattan a couple of years ago. And proceeded to uh, have it just go haywire and like hit the wall, and, and uh, so yeah, uh, that was a stupid mistake on my part. But uh, the drone, like I said, it's pretty well made, so it survived the incident. But now you'll actually be able to fly them indoors. And one of the things they showed at the event yesterday, which I thought was funny, was it was a wedding ceremony, and they were actually it was in a church, and they were flying the drone around the bride and groom as they were saying their vows. Mm. And then when they <laughs> kissed, it like flew away and like got a wide shot of everybody in the church clapping. But all I can think about as I watched it was these things are really loud and it's like five yeah. feet away from them just like buzzing in their ear you know obviously it was just shot for the purposes of a commercial but it's right. just funny to think about because things I mean it, it has to lift this thing off the ground with these four spinning blades so it's pretty loud yeah it looks pretty cool I'm uh, thinking about getting one I don't know about the famous I mean they're a you, lot of fun they are a lot of fun if you are like a noob like should you just go for it and just get the Phantom 3 and be done with it or should you like kind of try a cheaper one first or what do you think well they've they've done something funny actually uh they're uh the new app that's coming out has a flight simulator mode on it so it actually is like a digital game i don't know how well this is going to work it's, it seems silly to me i just thought it was funny that that if you're nervous about buying your thousand dollar drone you can play a little video game that teaches you how to fly the drone and you can use the controller and everything like that um i, I think it's very easy to fly uh i have not uh, other than the GPS incident, um, having flown this around, I, I threw, flew it through the arch at Washington Square Park, which if I did it today, I'd probably be thrown in jail for being, you know, like a terrorist act or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I've flown it in some pretty tight spots. Um, it is nerve wracking to fly it because it's a thousand plus dollar flying right. machine and it, you just feel like it could just, you know, fall out of the sky at any moment. But uh, I've even felt comfortable, you know, handing off to friends and letting them fly it and try it out. Um, just it, it's very easy for beginners, I think. I wouldn't worry too much about it. You don't want to go crazy with it. Don't fly it around trees or power lines. Get in a nice big open area. Right. But, uh, yeah, it works pretty well. Cool. Well, thanks for that, Neil. And uh, lastly, we'll just to wrap it up. I've, obviously, there was a ton of news this week. So I would just say, you know, go to appleinsider.com and check it all out. But uh, HBO Now launched on iOS and the Apple TV. And again, it's a, an exclusive partnership, at least for now. Sling TV will be getting it soon. But you can go on your Apple TV. There's a new HBO Now channel, at least on the uh, Apple TV version 2 and 3, the, the two most recent models. And uh, check it out. There's a free trial, which uh, that's I've tried it because it's free. So I figured, why not? So I'm trying that out. Um, worked well. You know, you could stream all that. You have the shows, of course, and you also have some documentaries on there and movies and stuff like that. So uh, check it out. And also, notably, Star Wars uh, forever has not been able – you've not been able to purchase Star Wars uh, digitally. You could only buy the DVDs or Blu-rays. 
And um, I was actually just about to buy the Blu-rays and just rip them so I can have them digitally. And then they announced uh, that tomorrow, Friday, April 10th, you'll be able to purchase the all six uh, episodes of Star Wars, episodes one through six on iTunes digitally, 20 bucks each. Uh, you can pre-order it today, but I mean, you can just buy it tomorrow. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool and uh, I'll probably be doing that. So. It, it is funny that now that Disney owns Star Wars, they're still employing the same strategy of Lucasfilm, which is to stretch out the releases. Although I guess Disney's been doing that for a while where they put movies in the vault. Yeah. But uh, they're not releasing the unaltered original trilogy, even right. though those were put out on DVD some years ago. So you know that all the nerds are going to be clamoring for that, but we'll buy these anyhow, waiting for you know uh, the edition where Han Solo shoots first and all that. <laughs> Right, so yeah, these are they're the special editions, uh, I guess you could say, as far as the original. So you, yeah, series. you get the horrible looking digital job of the hut and yeah. Uh, yeah. all that stuff. That uh, that. Yeah. Although I guess I don't know if you, you can't really get the originals right now either on Blu-ray either. Those well, those... you could get them on DVD. They did this stupid DVD, thing right. because George Lucas likes to make money, so I guess he's not that stupid. But uh, <laughs> they did this thing where um, they released them on DVD, but they didn't uh, include 5.1 sound because they said, oh, you guys wanted the original movies. Well, here they are with just stereo sound because that's how they're originally released. Isn't that what you wanted? And yeah. everybody's like, well, actually, we kind of like the 5.1 sound. We just don't like all the digital crap you did. And they never uh, released it with that. So if you want to get the true edition, you have to get – um, which uh, uh, I don't know if anybody still has a laser disc player, but you have to get the laser di- <laughs> disc editions from the 90s okay. because th- those were the last ones uh, released digitally that were the original unaltered trilogy. I bet, or at least maybe I'm hoping, that maybe right before episode seven comes out this December, uh, they'll release those. Oh, they're going to do just, it. They're going to do I it. Can I just say that you rattled off all of those specs and then tried to make it appear as though you are not one of the nerds that are waiting for the part <laughs> where Han shoots first? I, you know what? I am so tired of Star Wars. Uh, I have pretty much no interest in it at this point just because it's just been run into the ground with the uh, the prequels and fandom that has just gotten out of hand for some pretty enjoyable, great movies. I don't understand everybody's obsession with it. Uh, but yes, I am a very big nerd. Uh, <laughs> you're absolutely. Not, you're not excited about episode seven at all? Uh, I'm, you know, after uh, J.J. Abrams kind of uh, uh, turned Star Trek into Star Wars, like I always enjoyed that Star mm-hmm. Trek was, you know, about like moral choices and they were basically like, it wasn't like, you know, fighter pilots. They were basically like big lumbering uh, Navy ships that were flying in space. It wasn't like that. And then they turned it into, you know, these like action packed scenes with people flying through space and flying little ships and stuff. Uh, I don't have a lot of faith in J.J. Abrams, but mm. I will obviously be there to see it. I'm excited to see it just because You'll be I'm there a nerd. In your Jedi hood, I will be. I'll bring my uh, I'll bring my toy lightsaber <laughs> and uh, all that. But yeah. <laughs> no, and no, I'm 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 a Star Wars fan. I'm just kind of burnt out on it at this point. I hear you. Okay. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Neil, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can read my stuff at Apple Insider, obviously, and uh, I'm on Twitter at this is Neil. And Shane, how about you? As always, you can find me at Apple Insider. And you can find me on Twitter at Stephen Robles and uh, read my stuff on AppleInsider.com as well. And definitely uh, tweet at Apple Insider if you have any questions, suggestions for the show. Please rate us on iTunes with a five-star rating. We greatly appreciate that uh, when you do rate us. And uh, you know, if you don't know what to write, comment what Apple Watch you pre-ordered. And you can comment on the post when this goes up for the podcast or tweet at us. We'd love to know if or what model Apple Watch you pre-ordered this evening, Friday morning. And uh, thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.